All right, so today on the bench, we've got a Fender Pro Junior 3 with a busted input jack. Just check in there to make sure the pilot light is on. I'm going to run a Fender Stratocaster through it just to get an idea of if there are any other issues with it so we can get them all addressed at the same time. So let's see what it sounds like. So it looks like the volume pot's pretty dirty. It's got some oxidation in there on the carbon probably. We can spray that out, out with some deoxid, see if that fixes the problem. And we'll need to do that with the board uh, drop down, which we have to do anyway to replace that jack. So uh, we can get it all knocked out at the same time. Here's a closer view of that jack. You can see part of the top of it's been broken off. Probably some sort of accident at a gig. It's still functional right now, but it won't be for long. And it's pretty ugly. So you can see me wiping my hands there. There's some sort of gunk on the amplifier. I think ultimately it's probably WD-40, uh, which you should really never get near your amplifier with, but uh, it, it often happens. So we're pulling the screws out. I'll leave the two bottom right screws in. They're holding a cage on the baffle to protect the tubes. So look at that little crack there on that back placard. We'll see if we can not address that. Okay, looks like there's some sort of something has dripped down that foil from the top. Maybe it's related to that gunk there on the tube cage. Maybe it's beer. It's not, not exactly clear what it might be. The magnet on the speaker uh, makes a great way to store those chassis screws. There I am grabbing some paper towels, trying to figure out where that gunk's coming from, get it off my hands. With my magnifying lamp, I usually give things a good once-over visually to see if uh, anything pops out to me. On the Fender model amplifiers that have that PCB with the tubes on it like that, uh, typically there's some sort of crowning, some sort of connection issue there on that board, uh, either already present or waiting to happen, so I always give that a good look. All right, next we'll pull the tubes, test them. I'm going to take a good look at those power tubes. See, that one seems to be missing any sort of labeling. Uh, I want to make sure that they're burning the same. One of them's not uh, running hotter than the other one. That would be the in an indication of an issue. Um, originally, I thought maybe one of them was running hotter, but uh, groove tubes on that particular set of tubes use an adhesive label on them and the adhesive is just not great at sticking. Uh, later in the video you'll see uh, the label come off the other power tube. So the soldering iron's on now. Uh, it's hard for me to get used to how quickly this one heats up. My old one uh, used to not. This guy will be pretty hot right about now, but uh, we'll have him on and ready to go. And using that vintage tube tester there that I've got, we'll hit these tubes a minute and see what's going on. So the Pro Junior uses a couple of EL84s. I like to test them left to right typically, so if I do find an issue with one, I can know exactly where it came from. Tapping them uh, is a good way to agitate the tube. If there's a short in it that's not uh, extreme, uh, tapping it will usually make it short. It's much better to do it on a tester than it is while it's inside your amplifier. Uh, that one's actually shorted, uh, which is why I kept hitting it so long. Um, once I see uh, the short bulb light up, I usually want to recreate it just a triple check that there's uh, my eyes aren't deceiving me and in this case they were not so 
So I was worried this guy might be shorted as well. He's not. But we're giving him a good little smash. There's that adhesive label I was telling you about. So we'll hold on to that guy. We can't put him back in the amplifier because power tubes need to be matched sets. But uh, he'll go in the parts drawer for some sort of use later. Next we're going to test those preamp tubes. The Pro Junior uses a couple of 12AX7s. It's got no reverb. Unlike the Blues Junior. Yeah, that guy is uh, testing bad. He is trash. I usually like to test both sides of the tube just to see how bad the tube might actually be. They both appear to be the original groove tubes. All the tubes in this amplifier appear to be original. You can see that needle fall. That's a pretty bad, uh, pretty bad thing. That one's actually shorted on one side. So it's uh, bad, bad. That'll definitely have to be replaced. It's a real shame, you know, if you think it's going to be a quick, easy repair or, or a relatively inexpensive repair, but, uh, you know, with having to replace all four tubes, especially if you put groove tubes back in it, uh, it's no longer an inexpensive repair. So I like to take a look at the uh, speaker jack there to make sure there's no oxidation on it. There's not. If there were, though, I'd give it a quick clean with some uh, deoxid. You can see in the meter or... Maybe if you can get past that glare on my multimeter, we're just oming out the tip and sleeve of that jack, just making sure that uh, it looks the way we expect. Again, if it were oxidized, I might see something kind of funny, but that's an 8-ohm speaker, so uh, it reads pretty close to 8 ohms. That's fine. There I'm using a large resistor to uh, drain down the caps. There's a lot of controversy over whether or not you really need to do this or not. Um, in my opinion, you definitely need to do it. It is, uh, you know, when you're working alone, uh, you know, you get electrocuted and, uh, you know, it can be hours before anybody finds you. So I, I take safety very, very, very seriously. And uh, I have been... Uh, bitten before. So right now I'm just resoldering the tube sockets. There were a couple of connections that were crowning. They had started to develop lines around them uh, in the fillet of solder. So when you're resoldering those, typically on a fender like this model, I'd probably go ahead and resolder them all anyway, but especially when you can tell that there are issues. Uh, you just want to go ahead and resolder all those. Those ribbon cables, uh, they need to go back the way uh, they are. So you can see I'm pulling them out so I can access the sockets, solder them, and then I'm pushing them right back. That's for noise reasons. If you don't do that, uh, you'll induce some noise, and, uh, and then you'll find yourself trying to chase down a problem that's not really there. Um, it's just bad, uh, bad you know, wiring management. So you got to make sure you, you don't forget to do that. Um, looks like there's like some, maybe some foil or something in there. Uh, maybe some metal shavings from manufacturing. That's what I was touching earlier. So I'll get that out in just a second once I'm done soldering. Just in case I get a blob of solder or something. Uh, I'll wait till I finish soldering. The other thing to keep in mind about these fender tube boards and the sockets is that if you change the tubes a lot or if you stress them out, you can actually break the pads off of the circuit board. And at that point, you've got to go in and reinforce it. Uh, I've seen that happen on the Hot Rod series. Uh, I'd say it's probably common. 
Not incredibly so. All right, so we're pulling out the foil, metal pieces, whatever. Anything like that, getting near some high voltage could cause major, major issues. Just got to make sure we get that out. Also make sure we don't uh, blob solder. So these knobs here actually have set screws, although the pots are D-shafts, which is a really nice touch. Um, I was originally annoyed. I, I hate set screw knobs. But because of the D-shaped the, the, the shaft, uh, these knobs are easier to get on and off. And then the set screw um, was just like an added uh, security measure, I suppose you could think of it as. Uh, here we're pulling the nut off that busted jack. I'm dropping the board down. So I've already clipped, uh, you saw me clipping the, the, t the uh, tie wraps around the wire so that we can drop it. Oh, look how rusted that washer is. We'll put some WD-40 on that, see if we can rescue it. I don't know if somebody, somebody must have spilled beer on this thing. That's it's pretty common. I mean, the, the Tolex looks really good. There's no, like, sweat rings or, or anything. So, you know, who knows? It's it's hard to tell. So we're just dropping the board down. Uh, we'll pull the rest of the screws out. You want to make sure that you do it in the order I've done. Oh, here's a closer, video, a closer view of that tube socket. That's what I was talking about earlier when I was soldering. But you want to make sure that you go ahead and... Uh, remove anything holding the board from the very top, like what was holding the jack, knobs, etc. because before you remove those screws, because we don't want to stress those components out and those connections, especially when we put it back together. Um, we don't want to stress out anything, any work that we've uh, we've just completed. There's only a handful of screws. One of them is a, the top right corner is a ground screw. Uh, it is very, very important that that screw gets put back in um, snugly. All right, you got to be careful with this. Uh, the Pro Junior is not that bad, but the Blues Junior can be real stressful. You do not want to flex the circuit board when you're pulling it down. Uh, you just want to pop it out. Don't pull any wires. Sometimes you have to pull that pilot light wire out, uh, but in this case I didn't have to, which is, you know, hey, that's cool. All right. So you can see I'm marking uh, one of the wires on the power switch, and I'm pulling two of them. So when you pull two, mark one. That's pretty good. All right, we're going to get a closer view of the mag lamp to look at some solder connections. How do the connections on the pots look? Those are what I'm most worried about on a Pro Junior or a Blues Junior or a Hot Rod Deluxe or DeVille. Um, and then from there, you know, you want to look at some other things. Are there any burn marks? Yeah, so I'm going to re-solder those pots. Uh, a couple of the connections don't look fantastic anymore, but while we, more than that, while we've got the thing down, this is preventative maintenance. You just go ahead and knock it out, and it'll be good for a few more years. And then, you know, there's no point in being especially discerning. Uh, it is way more efficient to just solder any connection that looks suspect than it is to say, hmm, is that a good connection or not? You know what? If you have to ask, resolder it. Uh, the only thing you want to avoid resoldering typically is maybe a wire or something because you'll find that you've desoldered it while you're attempting to resolder it. It's a uh, can be a real bummer. All right, I pulled the jack. I wish I could have gotten a better video, a better view of that. But all I did was heat all four pins of it at the same time, get them hot, get the solder flowing, and gently pull it out. There, I'm using my uh, solder sucker to uh, clean the holes out, so that when I go to replace the jack, which unfortunately I'm gonna have to order, uh, I've got four clean holes. Okay, next we want to go ahead and clean those pots. I'm using some Deoxit D5. The straw's bent a little bit so that I can get into uh, potentiometers and give them a good spray. I don't want to get any Deoxit near those power tube sockets. Uh, that's a recipe for bad juju. Giving them, you know, good physical full deflection left and right while cleaning them. The only way to clean them is to drop the board down, so I want to be very thorough because I don't want to have to drop the board down again. That's a waste of time. 
So that's why you can see I sprayed them twice. I'm using a little bit of that deoxid that's on the paper towel just to sort of try to wipe some stuff off. Because uh, that paper towel at this point is pretty much trash. So no point in letting a good bit of cleaner go to waste. Yeah, appears to be maybe some of that beer or some sort of gunk uh, in that uh, metal bit there. So we just give it a quick clean. Using some Windex, uh, just plain, well not Windex, but just a glass cleaner uh, to clean the top of the chassis. Trying to be thorough. All right, now we're going to put in the power tubes. They can only go one way. I think I broke open a quartet to get a uh, duet out of them. All right, next we'll throw some preamp tubes in. There's a trick with the groove tubes. Uh, the way they're packaged, it's best to open both sides of the box. Uh, they're taped on each end, so you got to cut it. If you open them up, you don't have to sling the box, worry about the tube going flying. There's no paper cuts while trying to reach for it. You just push from one end to the other, and it comes out very cleanly, very quickly. That's by far the easiest way to do it. All right, so... I ordered uh, ordered that jack. Luckily, I had plenty to do to stay busy while I waited for it to come in. And so now that it's here, we're just going to install it. It luckily came with a new nut and washer, which is great. Uh, it's going to look a lot better than putting that old washer back on there. All right, you just ease it in. It'll snap. Uh, you want to be gentle so you don't tear the pads. I'm going to solder one uh, lug of the jack just to make sure it's held and then get a look at it, make sure it's flush to the board, and then solder the other four, I mean the other three, excuse me. All right, we'll check our work, make sure it looks good. Also, it's been a couple of days since I worked on the amplifier, so I want to make sure I didn't forget something. All right, we're spraying out the pots again. Like I said earlier, uh, the only way to clean those pots is to drop the board down. It's an annoying process. So we're just going to make sure that those pots are not going to give us any more trouble. All right, it's time to put that board back in. So again, you want to be gentle. You do not want to flex the board. The only way for me to do it is to stand up. By standing up, it's easier to line up the pots and the jack and the hole where they go. All right, we're gonna put that washer and nut on the input jack, not all the way. We just want to uh, get it a few turns on so that the board is being held, everything's lined up, and then we can put our screws back in uh, the way they're supposed to go. So I'm putting all the screws in before I tighten them down. And then we that's uh, the ground screw there in the top corner. That one's got to be super tight. All right, I want to make sure we haven't pinched any wires. I want to reconnect that power switch back. Then we'll go ahead and tighten that input jack. So if you tighten the input jack and somehow doesn't line up quite right and you over tighten it then put the screws in the circuit board you'll snap the connections on that jack um, you can do the same thing with pots uh, depending on the piece you're working on so I'm gonna hook up you're gonna see me hook up my uh, meter I'm gonna use an alligator clip uh, to connect my black lead to ground on the chassis that's not really the best place to put it it's not a terrible place but typically the lower down on the chassis 
the better because if something were to go wrong, that alligator lead's going to drop. Okay, you can see that's ground. Uh, there's some oxidation on my meter lead, so one ohm. That's uh, definitely a, a good ground connection. All right, we're just going to, we're plugged in through my light bulb limiter right now, so voltage is going to be a little bit low, but you can see we hit the uh, the negative voltage, the negative 8 volts or so is my bias voltage, and then the 250 volts or so is uh, my high voltage. So I just like to check and make sure all that stuff's uh, there and present. It's a little bit low because we're through our light bulb limiter, but uh, with the amplifier being open, I do not want to... Uh, take any chances and, and get electrocuted. Okay, so my light bulb limiter tells me that uh, that everything is okay. There's no uh, dead shorts or anything. I'd be seeing that on the light bulb. The caps are charging up the way they should. Uh, we're going to take it up to full power. The amp sounds okay. Just at full power, I'm just going to show you real quick. That bias voltage uh, winds up being about negative 10 volts DC, I think. Yeah. So just wanted to show that to you. Uh, to show you the, the difference between operating that amp uh, through my light bulb limiter, which if you're not familiar with that, I can I can uh, link something that to you. Just, just comment and ask me about it. Um, there are uh, pot stabilizers, which are pretty cool. I'm putting those back on. Um, they go on, and then the, the knobs go on over that. Uh, it's a really great feature. Not all the Hot Rod series has those. All right, so remember... Those back screws attached to the speaker magnet. And we'll get that back baffle back on. Uh, you don't want to tighten down all the screws, and you want to make sure that you don't over-tighten any of the screws. Uh, they'll compress that baffle, and nothing you do will make it look as good as it did before you over-compressed it. All right, time to put those knobs back on. Uh, you won't get to see the process because I had to stand up to do it, but they're back on. So now that everything is back together, we're going to plug it up full power, see what it sounds like, make sure there's nothing weird going on. <laughs> Okay, thanks for watching. Check out CommonwealthProAudio.com in the description of this video. Thanks.